Hi, Leo here. You know, we listened to your comments. Remember we went and visited Audi Sport and that e-tron quattro test at Sebring? And the new fan favorite, Ulrich Baretsky, the head of Audi engine development, really kind of hit a vibe with you guys with his interview and the part we showed you. Well, guess what? Here's the entire Baretsky interview, uncut, on the uncut section of Drive for you to enjoy. This will be the first of a number of these uncut moments, because all that interview stuff we do, there's a lot of good pearls in there. And Baretsky, he's our man. Listen to him and love him. Thanks. So I'm going to ask you uh, the first question about your, your engines and uh, diesel technology. What is it that I don't know enough to ask you about the new TDI technology coming in the 2012 race car? Yes, this uh, technology is, let's say, another step in development from the last year's uh, engine. So we are working every year from, st from, from engine to engine, not only from the V6, also the 12-cylinder, 10-cylinder we did, on the combustion process, which is the core thing of a diesel engine. The better you can burn diesel, the more efficient, the more clean, the more powerful. And this is a science. Uh, hundreds of a tenth of a millimeter makes already a big difference in some areas. And uh, to exploit the potential and the possibilities, you have to make a lot of development work. And one year is not enough from one Le Mans race to the other. So you have to make a program and you work as far as you can. Then you make a stop for Le Mans and then you continue after that. Or and you have as well to react on change of rules, for example, like last year when uh, the, the ACO or the governing bodies decided to reduce the air restrictor, means the amount or the mass of air you have available for your engine and the boost means the charge you have in the engine. And this makes you react to recover as much as you can from the power you have lost by this change of rules. And, uh, yeah, and overall, we always try to increase the efficiency of the engine in general and specifically for this year, we have also worked very hard to reduce substantially the weight of the engine, which was already a very lightweight engine. But uh, thanks to the fact that we had to integrate weight neutral, a hybrid system, we had to reduce the weight of the whole car and the engine had to contribute its part. So from, from that standpoint, I, without giving secret, did you find the weight saving in redesign of parts, integration of systems, or less parts? Uh, only by taking each part and working on it, maybe replacing material, taking more expensive materials, or changing the surface treatment, or heat treatment, or making new calculations, and, and or just taking more risks. Because you cannot stress a material to the very end, there are limits, and we are maybe are just about to exploit this limit. That's why we are here in Sebring for testing on this bumpy road, uh, where the engine is stressed mechanically more than in Le Mans. And it was always a perfect test ground here to find out any weak points in the structure of the engines. And this is a very essential thing for us because we have also taken away some weight from the from the crankcase, which is the the supporting element which keeps, let's say, the rear axle and the monocoque together. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to find out whether all our calculations or assumption are right, we are here and we are running here three or four days and then we will see, hopefully not. If systems are supposed to integrate and yeah. e-tron is one of the systems that adds to your engine, what, what factors did that create in terms of needing to redesign the V6? Nothing, okay. nothing. Okay. That's the good thing. For the engine, basically, the, as, as a mechanical part of the car, it doesn't matter whether it's an e-tron or an ultra. They are running the same engines in both cars. We are also running the same mapping in both cars. The difference is made by the strategy how the car is driven. When you have an e-tron, and then you have the choice whether you do an economic run and you are running on a fuel safe mode. This influences a certain way the engine, or you are running on a qualifying mode. This does not influence the engine because it is normally used to run on qualifying, except you really want to save fuel or you have to save fuel as we had to save last year in the very last stint in Le Mans with our three Peugeot friends in our neck and fuel running out and then we have really to play everything in the engine that you keep the consumption as low as you wouldn't believe it to arrive at the end. And this will be supported in the future by uh, the hybrid, by the e-tron.
did that make last year's win your most proud win? I think it was for sure the most the most stressy win in the last 25 minutes. You know, with all the accidents, it's sad, it's always tragic if you lose a car, but I was not involved as an engine guy. But in the last 20 minutes, it was all down to the engine and down to the consumption of the engine. And I said, I don't want to lose this race in the very last moment. And it was funny because they really made an efficiency run. We changed time against fuel. We had an advantage of 30 seconds and we screwed down everything and the driver had to back up to change this into fuel to come to the very end. In the 24 hours? In as the 24 hours. As you saw the race develop, how far back, how many hours did you back strategy to get to where you knew we were in position to win? I think I never lost confidence that we would okay. win. It's oh. funny, no, it's funny. Uh, it's not that I'm always an, a super optimistic man, but I had somewhere the feeling and at midnight when we had this huge accident and the second car was gone, most of the people were at the moment completely down altogether. But first of all, nobody left his position, never, nobody. They all stayed in position, they just swept to the remaining car and worked or tried to help wherever they could to get this car going and after an hour or two, no, no meeting has been done, nothing. You felt everywhere, there was, a, there was a common spirit growing from every corner, you could seize it. This was something I had never seen in Le Mans before, that people are so motivated, said, hey, if there is a justice, we are going to win, and if not, we, we will do everything. It shouldn't be our mistake, and we do everything to win this race. And if it's really come to a good end, this will be a fantastic victory, and it was. Do you think the Peugeot people felt that? Do you think they saw that? I think they were surprised. They were surprised by the fact that we didn't fall in tears and lay on the ground and gave up. The contrary was. This is something typical Audi. You are sitting in a, and I have seen this in other areas very often, we are in a desperate situation and everybody will say it's done. They will never win this race with one car against four Peugeots. But there's one word in, in, in our environment, race environment, never give up. And this is also one of the logos in Audi, never give up. We always find a solution, we fight for it until the very end. And this is something we made last year happen and all our boards which were around us are completely impressed about this motivation that we have seen there and the spirit we have seen there. That's something you cannot buy for money. This is something you can only see in such a situation and it gives me as a, as a head in, in management, it gives me an extremely good feeling about the crew, about the environment, about the people which I'm working together, how much you can rely on them in critical situations. It was an extremely good feeling. Tom and Alan asked me to ask you challenging questions. <laughs> yeah. I would rather take a more op opportunistic, op optimistic view of that. Yeah. I know you've led with engine development and engine innovation. So if you were in charge of racing around the globe, what would you want to have happen as the rules for new engines in motorsport? There's a very simple thing I would like to see it happen for the engine or for the racing in general. It's not only down, it's down to the engine at the end of the day because these are the energy consumer, if you want. What I would really, and what I'm fighting for since years, is that we come to rules that respect the demands of our daily life. You know, energy is expensive, not expensive enough, it will become more expensive, it will become precious. So people have to have the feeling that what we are doing in motorsport is not entertainment on Sunday, people or Saturday, people are watching, see cars going in circle. No, they should watch us developing technologies to make their life easier or their mobility affordable. And that's, that's my dream all these years, and this is my motivation about the technology we are doing, is really to make engines and powertrains more and more and more efficient, to take care about the environmental issues we are facing. We cannot deny it, they are there. We also have to face the fact that the oil reserves, whenever they will finish, because the globe is a globe, and this is a ball, and when it's empty, it's empty. And there will be a day and a moment where it is empty, but 
We should find solutions, technical solutions that allow us to go beyond this point, point with our mobility. So we have to work on renewable resources, we have to work on the efficiency of power drains by the help of e-tron hybrid systems or other systems, energy recovery. And the motorsport, I think, is the best place to showcase and to prove if the system is viable or not. Because if you are better than the others, that's the best proof. And if it's running in Le Mans 24 hours, then it's worth to go into production car. And that's our attitude. Why do you think, this is my perception, why do you think racing people are exceptionally innovative when given a set of rules, but when it's time to create the rules, they're very conservative? I have done both. Okay. I have done both, okay. so I can really understand it. Um, I always have the word, it's much easier to break rules than to create same, the same. And the, the reason is simple. Because in the moment we are sitting and making rules, which we have done several times with colleagues, then you are always in mind to close every loophole. What are the possibilities that would allow you to make it otherwise than I intend the rules should guide you? And this makes it so complicated. And I said, the best thing is to make a, a law book would be to bring all the criminals together and they should say how they should be written, because they know it best how to break it, then they should know it best how to avoid that laws are broken, or what should be done people to keep to prevent them from doing it. And that's why. And the other thing is always, you know, you have a certain point of view. I have the Audi view, if you want, or the diesel view, or the gasoline view, depending on the project I'm just in. And this makes your view a little bit limited, and the rule should be open. It should especially if you talk about efficiency, it should allow all kinds of systems which are reasonable, and only the word reasonable is already sure an inclusion, is already sure a limitation what is reasonable. But to allow people to go down this road in a guideline, you know, with, a, with barriers left and right so they don't go across somewhere, is not so easy, and to find a, a real justice and a real balance between all the systems, it's even more complicated. And it's always easy to shout at the governing bodies and say this is bad and this is wrong and this should be different. Yeah, make it better. Make a proposal. That's all I can say. It's not that easy. We, you, we look at the engine development that the past decade, um, and we've progressed with diesel so far. Have, do you think it's been, do you think we, you, besides Audi, do you think we have, as a, a society, new technology from racing to production cars as best as we could? Or are there limitations to what we've done? And are we falling behind from what's been learned on the racetrack? What can we use in production cars? Many questions, not so easy to answer. I think, being at Audi, I think we have done the best to integrate solutions from racing into road and this has become part of the philosophy of Audi and I'm very proud of that because we all here are part of this development. We have pushed it, we have contributed to it and it's a complete different approach. Recently I spoke about somebody about Peugeot. They never found the plot that the racing department is part of the technical development and contributes to future cars and future technologies. For them, racing is only going in circles and winning, and that's it. We in Audi, we are completely different now. This is a process which has been developed over the last 12 or 15 years that Audi and the responsible discovered what we are doing here. You said about the innovation of, of motorsport. It's worth to look closer at it, and since we are in Le Mans, and in Le Mans 24 hours means a complete Formula 1 race distance, in 24 hours, if technology is coming there and is proven as reliable and effective, there is no reason, except costs, why this technology shouldn't be available for our customers. And this is our philosophy and we are on our way. Also with diesel technology, we won't have a highlight like the FSI 12 years ago. You cannot always have this huge because the others are not idiots doing in, in production. But we can contribute here and there are a lot of things and we are sometimes five years ahead of the problems they may face five years later. And then we are easy, it's easy to hand over a solution or an idea of a solution. They can take it or not. But I cannot say we have nothing. And this 
is extended more and more and more. And the fact that the cars are e-tron or ultras, which should sign this is electrification, this is hybridization, or this is lightweight strategy, this means something that this is brought on the race cars first and nowhere else. This shows the, the link, the company, or the string, very strong link, the identification, the company like Audi has to us and vice versa. That's something unique. Can you tell us what you, your opinion is? What is your opinion uh, of the way the automotive industry stands today with alternative energy? Uh, the problem is, to my personal view, is the automotive industry has no real clue how to sort out the problem. So they try everywhere. And the biggest problem at the moment is to me that we in the automotive industry are very much driven by politicians which have no clue about technique. They are lawyers, they are whatever, but they are no technicians. And at the moment when I listen to the complete campaign about electrification, I can just say be careful because the currency, the electric energy has to come somewhere. And if I always hear an electric car is emission free, it's a lie, it's a big, big lie. And people don't want to be lied at. They are lied at by the politicians all year long. But technicians shouldn't lie. And we should tell the truth. Electric electrification is not environmental friendly, except, except the electricity is done by renewable uh, forms, be it by wind or heat or whatever, or the sun. But this is limited in the world. The world is not big enough to generate so much energy we would need to keep up the mobility only by electrification. It's part of it. You can concentrate this in big cities to avoid the pollution there. It's logic, it's good, it's fine. But that's not all. We have to think about alternative fuels, renewable fuels, to overcome the situation. There are very good steps here in America. I have heard recently about the algae. So you are creating organics. They are absorbing CO2, so which is a perfect solution. And they just need water and sun. And then you have fuel. Renewable, you don't take land, you don't take food from anybody. It's placed two-thirds of the earth are water. And until now we don't use it except shipping on it or throwing dirt into it, that's all. And we should think about how we can use this two-thirds of the surface in a reasonable way to solve the problems we cannot solve on the ground. And we can be part of it, yes. In racing even more so, because here we can showcase immediately the effect and I would rather like to see one day that we have an emission-free race, a CO2-free race. This is a dream. I hope I will live long enough. And I will do my part for it, believe me. We good? Yeah, I'm good. So after this, I have one question about the, the pressure in the engine. You talk, this is after this. Yeah, yeah. You talk about the turbo. Yes. And the turbo is pressurized, but the FSI has huge pressure. How the FSI was not that much, the, by far not like a diesel. The maximum pressure we had in FSI was 250 bar. Yeah, but. And in diesel we are talking about 10 times more. It's incredible. What does it give you? What is the advantage? I'm being naive, but I'm asking. What does that increase, increase, increase in pressure give you? Uh, the increase in pressure, it's simple to answer. Um, you have. Whether it's a gasoline direct injection or a diesel, it doesn't matter. You have a limited time to mix up oxygen and, 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 and fuel. And the more you are atomized, the spray, the bigger is the chance that the molecules find each other. And the more they find each other in this time, the cleaner is the combustion, the more efficient is the combustion, the more power you get out or the more efficiency. And Unfortunately, I have to say, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't ever look at it, we have gone into the diesel area. And I would rather like, before I retire, to go back once to a gasoline engine, direct injection, to use all this experience we have made with diesel. I think we could make a huge step, huge, huge step, with a direct injected gasoline engine, with all the knowledge we have now from diesel engine, believe me. Obviously, respect for Toyota and their Le Mans program. But will that become a test of diesel versus petrol? Yes. Okay. It will, for instance, become a test how unfair the, ra the rules are That's at the moment. I was ask. Is, it a, is it a technology it is. test or rules It is. Test? We know that. and we, we Okay. The problem is, until now, 
We only ran against privateers because when we ran diesel versus diesel, it was factory against factory, it was on diesel basis. But both, Peugeot and us, both, we are convinced in the moment a competitor is coming who is doing it with the same energy, with the same knowledge, they will blow us away. Not because diesel is worse, it's only because over the years the rules have been so much against diesel. Look at the tank capacity. Now a gasoline car has 15 liters, we with diesel are allowed to run 60. So 15 liters less, that's a lot. And if you do a very good efficient gasoline engine, then you have a huge advantage by that. Power-wise, the same. Efficiency-wise, if you do it right, it's an extreme, it can do very, it's not as efficient as a diesel, but the difference which is shown now in the rules is far away from the technical difference which is really existing. And this makes me think very, very, very hard how we can overcome. I have some ideas, but it's, it's, if, if this comes to work, it's, well, technology-wise would be a nice thing, yes. But it doesn't change the imbalance which is done in the rules, you know. But the other thing is to go and lose races five or six in a row to prove what we already know. Yeah. It's also not a real good solution for a racer, you know. Are you involved in the rules discussion or is that Dr. Ulrich? No, we are involved. I'm involved yeah. very often in Paris. And, and the problem is you are talking against walls. Yeah. Not because the people are not understanding what you are saying, they just don't believe it or they don't know it or don't understand it. This is difficult to say because they see when you are coming, when I'm coming, they say, ah, that's Boretsky, he is diesel and Audi. And whatever he says, he says in favor. And yesterday, funny enough you say that, we had a huge discussion over there with the governing bodies, some of them, and they fought very hard for gasoline engines. It's, it's called about valve timing, you know, because it's forbidden. I said, why? Why do you, for a diesel engine, it makes no sense. But for a gasoline engine, it may make sense because every, car normally is equipped with that now, it's not the special development. But if we talk about efficiency or pollution or both, then this is one thing you should have in an engine to overcome this. No, they said, no, no, we don't want it. So, but explain me why. You say on one hand you want to make efficiency rules and on the other side you ban all technologies with the argument it's too expensive. Say it's not expensive, I can buy these things off the shelf. If somebody cannot integrate such a system, I can buy it at Mercedes or BMW, Toyota, wherever, and say I want to have electric system or hydraulic, I can make a choice. And then I put this thing into my engine, make a little bit of casting around, and that's it. And then it's available. How do these racing policy decisions get made? Is it discussion? Is it the manufacturers agreeing and then going? Or is it finally someone with strength saying, that's it? I, I honestly, I cannot answer this question seriously because it's all an element of all of these things. Yeah. If you look at Peugeot, for example, it's not a politic, but they pulled out. And my argument is, it's not only a financial reason. There was a financial reason behind. But the fact they pulled out in January was a political and a personal decision. Somebody wanted to hit somebody. And the company is suffering from that, like hell. They have spent the money already. This little money they would have needed to go to Sebring and to go to to Le Mans is nothing compared to the money they have spent already. There are four cars built. There are existing two hybrids and two normal cars. We know that. And spare parts. Everything is there. And they are not allowed to race anymore. Done. Do you think it was a personal decision? Yes, think? yes. Because they sacked one of the boards half a week before this decision was taken and the follower, he wanted to set the point yeah. opposite to the other. And that was the reason. And that's how Unfortunately, more decisions are taken also in the governing bodies than we would believe. Yeah. If you would know about it, you would get angry because it costs millions, millions and thousands of hours, 10,000 of hours work from us and nights and days and weekends to, to react on these things. And at the end is a bastard, an idiot who has taken a decision because he has, he has an argument with his wife. Yeah. Yeah, we've always said. Uh, race fans want to know how these decisions get made yeah. and we've said you don't want to know it's better <laughs> you, you don't know it yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah.